Greetings booktubers and welcome back to Grammaticus Books. And today on Grammaticus Books, we're going to be covering the science fiction novel by Samuel R. Delaney called Babel 17, uh, published in 1966. And the question on everybody's mind is, Babel 17, is it a brilliant work or is it bat crap crazy? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes, it is both brilliant and it is bat crap crazy all at the same time. It is weird. It is wacky. Uh, and it's wonderful. I really enjoyed this book a lot. Um, in fact, I would say that uh, of all the recent science fiction that I've read, this book has separated itself from the background noise more than any other of my, my recent sci-fi reads. I really liked it a lot. It, it's just full of a, a literary flourish that I enjoyed. It's full of imaginative ideas, really far out there ideas. And I'll go into some of those. It has a clear plot with a clear trajectory with very little bloat. And it has great characters that just draw you into this book. Now, Samuel R. Delaney, he does drop you into the, the middle of this book, into the middle of this galactic conflict that he's created with little or no explanation as to what is going on. And you just have to figure it out as you go. And he drops pieces of the puzzle as he goes to let you fill it in slowly as you're reading the novel. And in that respect, it reminds me quite a bit of uh, The Lord of Light by Roger Zelazny where Rogers Lawson, he drops you into the middle of this world he's created, and you just sort of figure it out as you go. But unlike Rogers Zelazny, when you get to the end of Babel 17, there are going to still be pieces of the puzzle that you haven't figured out, and you're going to be scratching your head going, man, Samuel R. Delaney, did, did I just miss that? And the answer to the question is no, no, you didn't miss it. Samuel R. Delaney just never explained it fully. And that can be a little, a little confusing, a little disconcerting at times, but it doesn't happen a ton, and in, in part, it is part of the charm of the book. So what is the book about? And going forward, there will be some spoilers here, but no major spoilers, but there will be some spoilers, so just be warned. The overview of the book, what this book about is a, a galactic conflict between two political groups of humanity. The galaxy is divided into invaders and the alliance. And uh, in the recent years, the invaders have gained uh, numerous uh, um, tactical advantages and victories over the Alliance. And they've done so because they have a new tactical battle code uh, called Babel 17. And the Alliance is desperately trying to break this code. And they've had no success. So they turn to a Chinese starship captain by the name of Rita Wong, who is also a renowned linguist and a poet. And she's not just a poet, but she is the most renowned poet in all the galaxy. And they're hoping that her linguistic skills will allow the Alliance in order to break this code that has given the invaders such a tactical battlefield advantage and that they can turn the tables. So they give Rita Wong a sample of Babel 17. She takes it back. The day later, she comes back and she tells the Alliance, this isn't a code. This is a language all on its own. And it's so precise and so, uh, so well constructed that it, in fact, gives a tactical battlefield advantage. She goes, I haven't broken it completely, but I've broken it enough that I think I've been able to predict where the next attack is going to come from the invaders. And then they give her a starship and she goes out and she recruits a crew uh, to crew the starship to travel to the sector of space where she thinks the next attack is going to be. And that, in essence, is the plot. And what you learn that Babel 17 is, is Babel 17 is an entirely new language that's been constructed uh, in this novel by Samuel R. Delaney, and it revolves around a, a literary hypothesis that was created in the 1960s called the Sapir-Whorf Hypothesis. And what the Sapir-Whorf Hypothesis says, in a nutshell, is that there were different cultures on Earth that, that they evolved separately with separate languages. And if one culture had a vocabulary that was larger than another's, that had words for objects and words for ideas that another culture doesn't have, then that culture that has that expanded vocabulary is going to be superior to that other culture and will advance and be able to communicate more rapidly and more effectively. And it came into prominence about the 1960s, and Samuel R. Delaney jumped on it and used it as his basis for this book with Babel 17. Because Babel 17 is a language that is so comprehensive and so exact and concise at the same time that somebody who knows Babel 17 can look at any situation and immediately define the core of that situation and come up with a language to describe it precisely and in a very uh, exact and concise manner that is so concise and so exact and so uh, knowledgeable 
that it gives them an immense tactical battlefield advantage. And in addition to that, you can use Babel 17 to look at a person and you will be able to look at their physical characteristics and mannerisms and their physical muscul muscular emotions in order to tell what they are thinking inside and basically read their minds. And again, this all goes back to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, though, it has two uh, groups. You have the strong Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and you have the weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And all that means is to what degree you credit that theory. But that is, in fact, what Babel 17 is. And it's ahead of its time in terms of a number of ideas. And one of those ideas is cyberpunk, because this is, in fact, a cyberpunk novel. It's far in the far future, and when um, Ryder Wong goes out to recruit her crew, the humanity has evolved so far that they have uh, surgical um, techniques that can essentially let a human transform themselves into anything they want. And one of the crew that she recruits uh, is a 10-foot-tall humanoid lion called Brass, uh, who has transformed himself into this humanoid lion. And she goes out to all these bars and these clubs in order to recruit these, these very unique uh, non-transhumanist uh, individuals, these non-humans, these transhumanists, and into her crew. And it's one of the really wonderful things about this book because Seymour Delaney has basically jumped um, cyberpunk before cyberpunk is a thing, um, which is why I like science fiction so much. And there's another thing that he predicts in here prior to it becoming a uh, another science that uh, become, becomes popular in academia in 1975. But uh, Seymour Delaney is ahead of himself because cyberpunk really doesn't become popular. It doesn't become a thing uh, in culture until 1982 with Blade Runner. Or some people point to uh, the 1984 book by William Gibson, Neuromancer. And I'd say that uh, Seymour Delaney is doing cyberpunk all the way back in 1966. So what are some of the really weird and bizarre things that he puts into his book here? Well, when she's going out right along and recruiting her crew... She has to recruit trios because according to Seema R. Delaney, in order for a crew to be effective, they have to be grouped in these sexually bound trios. Yes, it's sexually bound trios. It's a bit bizarre because they won't work effectively unless they can work together and have that, uh, that congruity and that closeness that a sexual relationship brings. So she has to recruit these sex trios for her ship. And in addition to that, in order for a ship to navigate successfully through the voids of hyperspace, through the vast voids of the galaxy, you have to have discorporate on your crew. And Samuel R. Delaney, he starts in and he starts talking about the discorporate, and Ryder Wong goes out recruiting these discorporate, and it's very strange. It's you, you have a really hard time figuring out who the heck are these discorporate persons that she's recruiting. And eventually what comes about, what gets revealed, is they're dead people. And so yes, you have dead people who have been brought back to life who can be recruited to be part of your crew. And in fact, you have to have these discorporate, these disembodied dead people on your crew in order to be able to uh, efficiently and effectively look through space as your nose, your eyes, and your ears, and your crew, and your sensory uh, equipment in order to see hazards before you fly into them. And their discorporate have their own discorporate quarters on the ship, they have their own discorporate sections in cities. And Samuel R. Delaney never explains it, how the dead are brought back to life, under what circumstances they can be brought back to life, how they exist, how people interact with them. It never fully gets explained. And it's one of those things that just is sort of hanging out there. But it works really well as a literary and plot tool in the book. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, he also likes to do a lot of wordplay in the book. This is a book about uh, languages about uh, the use of words and about cryptology. So he works several of those themes through the book, not only with the, you know, the major theme being Babel 17 and that whole Sapir Wharf hypothesis, but he works in uh, alliteration. I think this is my own personal theory, I can't prove it, but I think that Rita Wong, the name of the main character, is a little bit of an alliterative term, an alliterative phrase for the phrase to right a wrong, which is one of the themes that runs through the book. In addition to that, Seema R. Delaney inserts a character into the book, a now dead um, person who was a lover of the main character, whose name is Mules Ehrenlide. And Mules Ehrenlide is an anagram for Samuel R. Delaney. So he works that little, little bit of a crypto magic into the book as well. 
And then on top of that, he has a character in here, Brass, the 10 foot tall, 10 foot tall, 10 foot tall pardon me, a lion being who when he speaks, he drops all the P's out of his words. So when his dialogue is being written in the book, the P's are omitted in any word that has a P in it. And instead, Seema R. Delaney inserts a, a apostrophe. And it's very annoying for about the first 10 pages, all these apostrophes where the P's are. And you have to go back and in your head, put the P's back into his words. But 10 pages later, you realize that your mind has taken over and is doing it subconsciously for you. And you're not even reading the apostrophes, you're putting the P's into it. And it's on purpose by Seam R. Delaney, just about how you can play with my, uh, people's minds and uh, how words and uh, symbols can be manipulated in people's minds. Um, speaking of which, he's jumped cyberpunk. One of the other things that he does in this book that is ahead of its time that he's predicted before it actually comes about is a, is a science. It's actually, it's deemed a pseudoscience if you go online, but it's not a pseudoscience. Um, it's called neuro-linguistic programming. So in 1966, Samuel R. Delaney is inserting elements of neuro-linguistic programming into the book Babel 17. And neuro-linguistic programming isn't officially invented until 1975. In 1975, you have two authors, uh, Bandler and Grinder, who come up with a book that is titled uh, The Structure of Magic that lays the foundation of NLP. What is NLP? NLP is looking at, a, at a, a person when you're talking to them and you're analyzing their physical mannerisms and you're analyzing the types of words they use in their sentences. And then you're using that information in order to make determinations about that person's personality and even make determinations about what they're telling you, whether it's false or whether it's factual. And that has to do with eye movement. And I'll go into that in a little bit as well. But all the way back in 1966, Seema R. Delaney is predating the, the uh, creation of NLP with several of these phrases with Babel 17 in his book, where he talks about on um, page um, 53 about muscular, uh, muscular reading, where he's reading the muscle uh, reactions of individuals in the book in order to see what they're thinking, where Babel 17 becomes, he takes that to such an extent where you almost can be psychic about what is being thought by the person by just looking at the, uh, the reactions of their muscles on their bodies. And he also talks about psychic indices, uh, creating um, uh, cultural tensions and uh, literal tensions in the person's body. And again, that all goes back to the foundation of NLP. And that is in this book, all the way back in 1966, and NLP doesn't even get invented until 1975, and it really doesn't get perfected until the late or the mid 1990s, is where it really starts to come into play in society here in the United States. And that was one of the really cool things that I liked about this book. So what is my conclusion on Roger Zelazny's Babel 17? I liked it. I liked it immensely. It is bizarre. It is a weird, weird book, but in the best way possible. Uh, it will be confusing at times. There are going to be things about this book. At the end of it, you're not going to understand what he was writing about, but it's just a heck of a ride. I liked it a lot. I do recommend it, but just be aware you're getting in for a very wild ride. Um, that and just one other thing I want to say. When I went to get this book, uh, I got this, this is a library book that I read. Um, they had one copy in the entire library, one physical copy, no other copies of this book. And I am uh, a member of a library system that has over 5 million titles in its library. 5 million titles. Roger Zelazny, a grandmaster of science fiction, his most popular book, a, a, a Nebula award-winning book, and they had one physical copy of it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I buy vintage science fiction whenever I can. And speaking, speaking of vintage science fiction, what a horrible cover. I just, that's a terrible cover on this. I cannot stand the cover on this book. Um, I know why they do it because it's cheap and easy to do it instead of hiring Frank Frazetta to do the cover of your book, which is gonna cost you a little bit. But oh my gosh, that is such, such a better seller selling point for a cover on a book than something that's just that that obnoxious of a cover, but end rant, rant over. With that, I'm going to wrap it up. Babel 17, great book. I highly recommend uh, that you guys go out and check it out. Just be aware that you're in for a wild ride. And with that, I'm going to say take care, be safe, uh, and I'll catch you guys next time. And next time, I will announce the winner of the uh, Isaac Asimov versus uh, Robert Heinlein contest. The votes are in. I've tallied them up, uh, and that should be up on Wednesday. So take care, be safe, and I'll catch you guys next time.